before I get started, I would like to ask, can the people online give reactions? People online, thank you. Paul, I was just gonna ask somebody to do that. Um, okay, so I was just gonna see if we can do that. Can I see if, uh, how many people can get a hands up online in the next 10 seconds? Give us a hands up. Everyone online, give us a hands up in the next 10 seconds. That's pretty impressive. I mean, so thank you guys for listening um, and for paying attention, even though I know it's not easy because we're not here. So, um, all right. With that, I'm gonna to talk today about digital public goods and I apologize, it is not something I'm an expert in, um, but it's something that's starting to get a lot of movement and I wanted to make sure that it got on the agenda uh, because over the next, uh, next PI, there is gonna be some more movement and I'd like to see who in the community is interested to, to help us with it. Um, but for clarity, I mean, some of the real experts are, are Ed Cable who unfortunately wasn't able to be here and Michael Richards and Paul Macon who's not able to be here. Um, I'm just going to talk about it. Um, all right, so yeah. I'm trying that too. There we are. All right, um, all right. So, what are um, what are DPGs and DPIs? One of the main things is I'd like you guys to, okay. Like everyone to understand, we're going to be hearing these terms quite a bit for those of you who are interested. So digital public goods, according to the Digital Public Goods Alliance, open source um, software, open data, open API models, open standards and open content, a lot of openness uh, that helps adhere to privacy and other applicable laws uh, and best practices, do no harm by design uh, and help attain the SDGs. Now that's a very specific definition for digital public goods. I think there's probably something a little bit more generic um, but Digital Public Goods Alliance has a very specific uh, mission around the SDGs. Um, so if any of that doesn't make sense to you, please look it up. It's, it's very interesting to look into things like what does do no harm mean? Um, DPI, the Digital Public Infrastructure, as uh, potentially a subset of that, uh, has less of a concrete definition, but one they've given is uh, horizontal enablers across all sectors to connect government, individuals, and businesses. Um, so these things should come as no surprise. All of you spent money to come to Arusha to talk about Mojuloop. So Mojuloop is digital public infrastructure and a digital public good. So that should not be a surprise. Hopefully also not a surprise to all of you that there are quite a few other digital public goods and digital public infrastructure out there. Here are five that we are tracking and working with very closely, but there are actually hundreds, I think, the dial um, uh, uh, list has something like uh, 2000 products that they're currently tracking. Um, and so that's why it's important for us to start talking about this is we are not alone in our mission of using open source to provide public infrastructure to essential services to citizens in, in, in countries. Uh, there are a lot of other people doing this and solving different problems. Um, and so it's important for us to start realizing that we are a part of a much bigger community uh, of, of digital public infrastructure initiatives. So one of the things that we wanna start looking at is how can these different DPIs and DPGs start collaborating? Um, so some of the benefits is what I'll go through here. One of the main ones is on advocacy and joint advocacy. My job, I think a lot of you know, even before I was in this role at Mojo Foundation, was on the advocacy of Mojuloop around the world. And I can tell you there are some definite challenges around helping governments and stakeholders understand how to implement a project, why they should implement, why they should use open source, uh, overcoming a lot of obstacles about uncertainty around what using open source means, um, as well as even among donors. We have a few uh, very uh, generous funders of a lot of open source uh, and DPIs around the world. There's a handful of them. There's a lot more people who have uh, funds that could go to improving the world or trying to go towards improving the world, but aren't, uh, don't understand what DPIs are. So as a community of DPIs, we can collaborate to work with all of those funders more effectively. Also on educating governments. And this is something that's come up a number of times. I think it was just mentioned this morning about how uh, difficult it is for a lot of uh, governments, even if there's a government agency, a client that wants to use a DPI, very often they're gonna go back to uh, their accounting departments or 
uh, treasury or their uh, whoever is responsible for the procurement process and realize there is no precedent for procuring an open source system. And all of a sudden it stops there because overcoming those obstacles is very difficult. So as a community of DPIs, uh, we might be more effective in, uh, in working with the, the whole of government, not just one. So we focus on central banks primarily, but the whole of government to solve those problems. Um, also lessons learned um, of how is the best way to support open source projects. Uh, there are definitely things that we as a community have probably not done right, but there are a lot of other communities out there who've tried similar things. We should be listening to them and, and learning from them. Um, and as a reference architecture for an entire digital society, how all these pieces fit together um, as a, again, the, the whole of society, the whole of government. Okay, sharing technical resources. Uh, there's also very few people who are qualified to work on national level infrastructure in the open source. Uh, and many of them are in this room. Uh, so as we look at sharing uh, resources across projects, that might also be a benefit of collaboration. There's a lot of people working on, on some of the other projects in OpenGDP and OpenIMS that have thought about things that we haven't thought about. Um, ensuring interoperability across these systems and, and security, and I'll tie those in together, is that a lot of these systems for governments uh, and for societies are going to be passing information around about citizens. And that's, I guess, the main point that we're making is, as you move from, we think very often about how do we keep the identity and the information about a, a citizen and their transaction secure and private. But if we're talking about moving and, and collaborating with other uh, projects, that data has to be transferred. And so we also need to be thinking about how do we make sure that that transfer of information about the citizen is secure and avoiding duplication and inefficiencies uh, and inefficient competition. Competition is always great, but inefficient competition, there could be overlaps between what some of these DPIs are doing. What we wanna make sure is that we identify those early. It's fine to have overlaps, but what we don't want is to say, well, you guys shouldn't use this because MojoLoop does a piece of that. We should have figured out how those two systems work in together. Challenges of collaboration, um, because anyone who's, there are a number of you who are starting to work with us on some of these different DPI collaborations. Uh, we brought in other DPIs that are in much more advanced stage than MojoLoop and some that are much less advanced stage. Um, and it's very difficult when we want to move at a certain pace and, and they're not there yet um, or vice versa. Um, the different uh, governance structures, we have a very specific governance structure. None of the other DPIs have the same governance structure as the MojoLoop Foundation, the MojoLoop community um, and the implementation modality. Some are doing it themselves. The actual foundation is doing implementations. Um, some uh, are much more hands-off than the Mojib Foundation is. Um, resource competition, the, the other side of the coin of uh, resource sharing is, for example, Michael, Ed, and Paul Macon, who's actually working on some of these collaborations. Clearly great to have them interested in what some of the other DPIs are doing, but clearly the Mojib community does not want to lose them to something more interesting. Um, so we want them focused on Mojulu. Um, so that kind of resource competition of people who are focused could potentially be a challenge. Um, similar donor pool. Uh, I think if anyone's interested in looking at DPIs and not just donors, funders uh, as well, uh, we want to make sure we're expanding that pool, but there is still going to be some competition uh, uh, if we're not careful uh, around when we start collaborating. Um, and cross-ministry collaboration. Uh, and great to have somebody from a government agency. I think that's what we're finding is crucial in a lot of the in a lot of countries is that that's probably the agency that should be able to oversee all of these different DPI implementations. Um, but having uh, the Ministry of Health and the Central Bank, the Ministry of Finance, um, Tax Collection, uh, and uh, Telecommunications all agreeing on how these different systems are going to fit together it is clearly going to be a significant challenge. Um, it's hard enough for us as it's hard enough for the, the Mojo Lend Payments community to coordinate the government agencies that we work with, uh, much less if we're trying to work with another community that works with different agencies. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip through this. All I will say is that another couple of other names that we'll start thinking up, uh, hearing a lot more about, and hopefully we'll be presenting is DIAL, the Digital Impact Alliance, and the Digital Public Goods Alliance. They are the ones who are doing the most around the collaboration 
between uh, uh, different digital public goods. So for those of you in the community, uh, if you hear from the folks at Dial or the Digital Public Goods Alliance, uh, please do collaborate with them. They're trying to bring us into the fold of uh, the D, uh, DPI universe. Um, actually, I will say that the one thing I do want to talk about there is on the, the POCs. There's one thing to talk about at a theoretical level and say, yes, we want to collaborate. But sometimes what does that mean is very difficult. There's a lot of nuanced questions that we can only answer by actually rolling up our sleeves and trying it. And that's what we're going to talk about in, in just a minute with Michael. Um, and then the other part is specific markets. Again, very nice to talk about it in a theory, um, but it's much easier if you have two deep, if you have a single country with a similar problem that's trying to solve it that could use two DPIs collaborating to get together. Uh, that's ideally where we're going to be looking at, at how we collaborate by focusing on, on a specific country that's asking for it. Um, so some examples of that collaboration. Uh, there's, there was an announcement, uh, I think a, a month or two ago, that OpenGTP and MOSIP are entering into a formal collaboration. We've had a long collaboration with MIFOS. Unfortunately, Ed isn't here to talk about that. Um, with uh, MojLoop, the, um, what we're looking at now is some collaboration between OpenGTP and, uh, and MojLoop. There's a specific country going through a massive crisis right now that's looking to disperse funds and doesn't have a payment system to do it on. Uh, and, uh, and so we're going to look at how OpenGTP and MojLoop might be able to solve that problem together. I'm sure there's a number of countries that are in that uh, situation. So we're very excited about the OpenGTP MojLoop collaboration. And then lastly, what, what Michael's going to talk about is uh, collaboration between MojLoop and OpenIMIS. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michael. Thanks very much, Steve. Sorry. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, okay, so I want to start talking about something that is a work in progress. And I'm sorry to say that quite a lot of this is going to be talking about my mistakes and missteps on the road, which I'm sure are not yet complete, uh, but eventually we will get to somewhere, I hope, that's reasonably good. Um, so first of all, open IMIS. Uh, is a digital public good organization which is developing open source versions of systems to manage the uh, administration and distribution of health services. Uh, their goal, as you can see, is to improve health financing operations by exchanging data relation to payments. So, for instance, uh, it, it enables people to record that tests have been asked for, health tests have been asked for on patients, that they have been executed, what the results were, and provides ways of uh, passing that information around uh, so that all the participants who need to know about those things can know about them. Uh, obviously a good thing. Uh, they have implementations, including, as far as I understand it, one in Tanzania. Um, and I want to pay tribute at this point uh, to GIZ, who are an organization, one of the sponsors of the Open IMIS project, who had the foresight to say, when we want to do uh, payments relating to health uh, matters, to health administration, um, how are we going to do that? We could invent it ourselves. And it must be said that in a lot of cases, uh, the, these institutions find it much easier to do things themselves than to collaborate with other institutions. But they said, no, we would like to set up a partnership with other kinds of institutions which specialize in the payment space so that we can interface with them and they can execute the payments. We don't have to get in the payments space ourselves. So they contacted us and said, can we put, start putting together some standards uh, which will enable open source health administration systems like OpenIMIS to integrate with open source payment execution systems like MojoLoop uh, so that they can extend the efficiency and the efficacy of the systems that they do. Um, so now I'm gonna start talking about uh, the sorts of things that they want to do. So obviously, the sorts of things are, they need to pay service providers for the work that they do. They need to pay clinics, 
for uh, seeing patients and performing operations on them. They need to pay hospitals when people need to go into hospital and uh, procedures are performed. They need to pay GPs and nurses who will go around and visit people uh, and do checkups, all of those kinds of people. They will be sending invoices to the health management system and the health management system needs to pay them. Second, they implement healthcare schemes. So these are schemes that people can join uh, where effectively they pay a form of health insurance, they pay a regular premium, and that means that they can obtain uh, health care when they need it without needing to pay extra. And finally, they need to disperse funds, funds like grants, funds like uh, maternity grants, for instance, when people have just had uh, babies, then it's not uncommon for them to get a grant from the government uh, to cover the initial expenses associated with a new baby. Similarly, there are things like uh, disability pensions, which may be paid through a health scheme or rehabilitation grants where people aren't able to work while they're recovering from pregnancy, all of those sorts of things. And those are uh, forms of large scale disbursement, but they are specific to health schemes. So, now I want to start talking about my mistakes. Because when they said to me, how should we do this? Uh, my first response was to say, well, of course, we understand how to do a payment. All you need to do is we will tell you the stuff we need to know. You send it to us and we will sort it out. Thanks very much. Uh, so we've got a payment manager. Uh, I guess most people who've worked with Roger Luke will be familiar with that product. And essentially what that does is it's something, it's a, it's a mediation product which looks like a standard Mojo Loop on one side and looks like something else, which might be a healthcare system, on the other side. So I basically said, well, you know, you send us some stuff, we will transform into some other stuff, we'll execute the payment, we'll send it back. Um, unfortunately, that's not quite the way things work. What they were expecting for, from us was something which would work in the way they are suspect works. So one of the things they do, for instance, is they use a product. Uh, this is a, sorry, it's a digital infrastructure product. I've forgotten the acronym for the moment. DPI, okay. Uh, which manages, uh, which provides a form of middleware for the system. Um, it mediates between, or can mediate between, the health management system and the payment system. But the clue is in the use of the word HI, which stands for health information. So it's a health industry specific piece of middleware. Now, you might look at it and think to yourself, well, actually quite a lot of this stuff, it's not really health industry specific. It's just a standard form of middleware that enables you to receive documents of various kinds. You can put together things to process, workflows to process those documents, and it will store them. It will provide facilities for you to look at them and so on and so forth. Now, HIM uh, is specifically targeted on health industry type documents. And again, there's an open source product called FHIR, F-H-I-R, which has a series of uh, specific, specific formats for health industry documents of various kinds. You could think of it as the ISO 2002 of the health industry. Uh, but actually, the mediation product and the specific documents that it deals with are really, they should be quite separate from each other, at least the principle. Um, however, they use OpenHIM, so that's a conversation we might need to have in the future. What we wanted to do was to have the health management system appear as a third party provider, which might also be known as a TISP or a 3PPI, you'll be hearing more about that tomorrow from Lewis, um, in the Motorloop system. And a 3PPI is an institution which wants to act in the payment system, in the motor loop system, but isn't an account holder. So when I hear people talking about fintechs, I think 
Those are three PPIs. They want to be members of the motor loop system, but they don't want to hold accounts. They want to give instructions to people who do hold accounts to say, please transfer funds from this account, which I have some kind of control over, or some kind of permission I have control over, to this other account. That's the sort of thing that they want to do. And the health management system, we think, is something like that. So it will want to issue payment instructions, instructions to settle bills from hospitals or from GPs or clinics, or alternatively, it will want to receive payments from people who are paying subscriptions to, uh, to health plans of various kinds, but it doesn't want to be a financial actor in the system. It doesn't want to do settlements, it doesn't want to do clearing. It wants the specialized institutions, the banks, the mobile money companies, to carry on doing that. Now, the open HIM system provides specialized mediators. So you can program a mediator in the open HIM system, which will effectively pick up a document, transform it in some particular defined way and do something else with it. So we only started, sorry, I started with payment manager um, but actually, it rapidly became clear that if we were going to do anything productive with the interface between these two systems, what we were going to need to do is to provide open HIM mediators, which would pick up things like, for instance, an invoice that was stored in the open HIM system and do something with that. And the something it was going to do with that is to initiate a payment request in the Modulink system to say, here is an invoice, it's been approved in the health management system, otherwise it wouldn't have appeared. Please execute payment on it. Uh, it would go off in the same way as payment manager currently does uh, and execute a payment within the Modulink system. And it would then get the results back and convert those back into a document in the open HIM system that said, here, the, here are the results of the payment request you sent me. So we are looking at the moment at how we can, well, the first question we're trying to ask is, is there any reason why we shouldn't just use an open HIM mediator? Are there any things the payment manager does which are absolutely necessary but which you can't do in open HIM mediators. We think the answer to that is no, uh, but you never know about these things. So we have some people far more technical than me uh, asking that question and uh, we were waiting for the answer to come back. So here is a brief flowchart of how, oh, sorry about that, yes, uh, I won't happen again. <laughs> um, what we think the payment flow will look like. So we have documents that turn up in the open HIM system. Uh, the incoming is a fire invoice document, which is produced by the health management system. That then goes through into the mediator and the mediator is doing all the things on the right hand side. Here. We try and resolve the debit party, if we can't, we send an error document, we create an error document in the open HIM. We then resolve the credit party. Similarly, we can't, then we uh, generate an error. Uh, if the accounts are okay, we try and make the payment. Uh, and if it's rejected by the credit of the FSP or if something else bad happens in the system, again, an error document is produced. If everything goes according to plan, which we kind of expect it to, Another fire payment notice is produced in the HIM system, which says this payment that you asked me to do, we executed it and everything was fine. So what the open IMIS system will see is a repository of documents, which it knows and understands, um, which enables it to do its reconciliations, to track the payments that it's making and all of those kinds of things. What the 
Mojaloot scheme sees is an approved third party provider saying, please make a payment from my account to this hospital or to this recipient who's just had a baby or whatever. All of that is managed inside the system. Settlement is done between the financial institutions as it ordinarily would be in a mojo loop system. So that's all working fine. Um, what we should have is a system which enables any open IMIS based system to interact with any mojo loop system without them needing to do anything particular or different in order to uh, work, well, apart from configuration things, in order to work with each other. Uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Excellent. So I think, um, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, there was a question from someone named uh, Africa Crypto Warlord. OK. I was really wondering if we were going to have some KYC issues with the uh, African Crypto war Warlord. Um, uh, and unfortunately, Paul Bing asked a, a good question. Um, it should know the technical cooperation between OSS initiatives. Uh, for example, how do we use most of identity to route most of the payments? This is exactly one of the things that we would like to ask and solve. And I think one of the main points of today was not necessarily to solve these problems, but to, to listen to one example of making sure it's clear to everybody who's working on MojoLoop that MojoLoop and payments in, in general are not in a silo themselves. Um, we talk about breaking down silos between financial service providers, but payments is not a silo. It touches all kinds of different things, and we have to make sure that we're able to, and we're thinking about that, and we're open to that. So Michael may have identified some challenges around how we're structuring things that all some of you may be saying, Nope, that's not how Mojuloop works. And so I'm not going to accept it. We might need to rethink some of those things if the time comes. Um, the other reason I wanted to do this was because I saw a few people leaning forward and, and I was hoping you were going to lean forward on this uh, because as some of you have some experience around uh, uh, different sectors. And what I'm hoping is that this uh, uh, helps us think about how we are touching other sectors. Um, so that's what we have today. Uh, but if anyone had, let's see. If anyone can think of other areas, we talked about health significantly today. If there are other sectors where we'd like to work together, please send uh, the three of us an email or join the DPG Collab uh, Slack channel um, where we're talking about these things. Let's see, John Mark, you look you really want to ask a question, so I'm gonna... Uh, thank you so much for uh, this presentation. It shows there is quite a big space where we can play uh, in regards to payment. I know you've picked the use case um, that is um, uh, centered around health, but it triggered my mind that um, industries for uh, education, um, industries for commerce, and many others can be simplified whereby you have all these entities focusing on what they do best, if it's health, education, or anything else, they could do that. And then we could provide them with some kind of uh, a payment SDK. So um, these can use this SDK, and then this SDK could be centric around Mojaloop. So we just provide, if you are doing open source for uh, health, education, um, e-commerce, or anything else, we just give you this SDK, and you can be able to uh, integrate uh, for payments. So I think there is some, there is a, a big industry there that we can uh, support uh, with uh, this approach. Thank you. So John Mark, if you were to think about something that was not a health information mediator, but just a digital public good uh, information mediator, which consumed documents uh, and for which you could write mediators, which for instance, executed payments as a consequence of those documents, uh, then you would have something to which, as you say, education, taxation, uh, digital public goods could connect to, as well as uh, health digital public goods. So I applaud your invention. Thank you, Mike.
Okay, that's all we've got time for. Thank you so much. And uh, looking forward to this being a part of most of the communities that we talked through. Oh, and Paul Makin, I will respond to you separately.